Section 38 of the Heroines of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Reese. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Madame Roland, Part 1. Madame Roland. The mind is its own place. Milton. Great events are the pedestals that bear aloft noble and beautiful characters, which might else lie low in obscurity. Nay, they are the chisel strokes which give bold prominence to characters that might otherwise have been unskillfully shaped, or destined to grace only a hidden niche. The revolutions that have repeatedly convulsed France must necessarily have furnished numerous subjects for history. Though there are many whose career was longer and more brilliant, there are few, if any, who came forth from the lower ranks of life, and secured by their talent such influence over intelligent minds as was gained by Madame Roland. Gifted with a vivid imagination, balanced by strong good sense, quick perceptions, and clear reasoning powers, and inspired by an ambition to emulate the old Roman heroines in the achievement of some great and virtuous deed, it is not surprising that she should have soared above the humble sphere in which her girlhood was placed, even had not her father's bitter denunciations against the all-powerful aristocracy, or the spirit which pervaded the lower classes before the outburst of the revolution, given shape and direction to her aspirations. Jean Manon Roland was born in 1754, in an humble home on the Quai de Ivrève, Paris. Her father, called Gratien Philippon, was an engraver, and daily superintended the thrifty shop with its busy workmen, which was the source of his limited fortune. By industry, economy, and the assistance of a prudent wife, he had secured comfortable apartments above the shop, where they lived as happily as his restless, fretful disposition would allow. At the time of Manon's birth, he had grown discontented with his lot in life. Hatred burned in his heart toward the pampered nobility who rolled in wealth while he and his fellow laborers were made to yield an unjust portion of their hard earnings to support the luxury of arrogant superiors. Madame Philippon had no sympathy with the feverish discontent of her more ambitious husband. Of a cheerful, placid temperament, she was satisfied to remain in the position in which God had placed her, and with the faith and fortitude of a Christian, performed in unquestioning readiness whatever she found for her hands to do. Thus to a virtuous, pious mother, and an infidel father, was given a young spirit ready for the molding hand of good or evil. Had Manon been one of several children, she might have been left more to her mother's guidance and instruction, but the only surviving child of eight, lively and precocious, pretty and winning, her father took her into his arms and heart, made her the constant companion of his leisure hours, and as she grew older carried or led her through the streets of Paris, listening with delight to her childish comments on the passers-by. Proud of the bright little Manon, he was maddened with resentment and envy at the sight of gilded coaches in which lolled richly dressed ladies, and children muffled in expensive garments fastened with jewels, any one of which would have given a coveted education to the poor artisan's daughter. Philippon gave vent to his anger in vociferous words which Manon did not comprehend, though they left a vague idea of an injured father and a dislike to dashing chariots and finely dressed people as the cause of his distress. The reflective mind of the little philosopher soon grasped and studied out the lessons her father gave. Before she reached the age when children are most occupied with pastimes, her head was full of the arrogance of royalty and nobility, and of schemes to fraternize and obtain equality among mankind. With no playmates, no pure air, green fields, forests, and gay songsters to impart the freedom and abandonment of childhood, with no diversion except daily walks in a crowded city with her father, who always took these occasions to teach her the wrongs of the oppressed poor, and too young to be of assistance to her mother at home, her busy mind found occupation, delight, and rest from her father's nervous suggestions in stealing away to her quiet little chamber and forgetting all the world in the perusal of her library, though this was so limited that she could number the books upon her fingers any day. Plutarch's Lives was her especial delight, a book she read and reread with an avidity that stored nearly the whole of it in her memory. 
her soul was awake to all that was beautiful or sublime, whether manifested in the works of nature, art, or the deeds of mankind. These pursuits did not interfere with her usefulness in the household. She was cheerfully obedient to her mother's commands, and uncomplainingly laid down a pet book when her assistance was required in domestic duties. Thus she became skilled in culinary arts, of which she said in her after life, I can prepare my own dinner with as much address as Philippomen cut wood, and congratulated herself that her judicious mother had prepared her for the vicissitudes that marked her maturer years. Madame Philippon's high tone of piety, together with her gentle instructions, soon won Manon's confidence. She readily perceived the superiority of a religion that cultivated peace, fortitude, and uprightness in its possessor, in strong contrast with the overbearing impatience and fretful repinings which her father's principles infused into his daily life. She chose the former, and for months religion was predominant in her pensive meditations, till her active mind was wrought up to an unendurable state of excitement. The cloister presented itself to her ardent imagination as the only method of attaining the saintly purity to which she aspired, and as a place of holiness and retirement most suitable for preparation for her first Christian communion. One evening she threw herself in tears at her mother's feet, beseeching her to send her to a convent. Madame Philippon was deeply affected at the request. She did not hesitate to gratify a zeal, equally commended by the father who desired to give Manon such an education as she could only obtain in a convent. After some difficulty in making a choice of the numerous religious houses, the convent of the Sisterhood of the Congregation in Paris was decided upon, as being conducted with less strictness and fewer of the extravagances of Catholic worship than most of the nunneries. Manon was accompanied thither by her good mother. The thought of the long parting from her beloved mother brought torrents of tears, and when the moment of separation arrived, the sensitive but courageous child was overcome with grief. In the memoirs that she penned, while confined in prison, she says of the separation, While pressing my dear mother in my arms at the moment of parting with her for the first time in my life, I thought my heart would have broken. But I was acting in obedience to the voice of God, and passed the threshold of the cloister, offering up to him with tears the great sacrifice I was capable of making. This was on the 7th of May, 1765 when I was eleven years and two months old. In the gloom of a prison, in the midst of those political commotions which ravage my country and sweep away all that is dear to me, how shall I recall to my mind and how describe that period of rapture and tranquility? What lively colors can express the soft emotions of a young heart endued with tenderness and sensibility, greedy of happiness, beginning to be alive to the feelings of nature and perceiving the deity alone? The first night I spent at the convent was a night of agitation. I was no longer under the paternal roof. I was at a distance from that kind mother, who was doubtless thinking of me with affectionate emotion. A dim light suffused itself through the room in which I had been put to bed, with four children of my own age. I stole softly from my couch and drew near the window, the light of the moon enabling me to distinguish the garden which it overlooked. The deepest silence prevailed, and I listened to it, if I may use the expression with a sort of respect. Lofty trees cast their gigantic shadows along the ground, and promised a secure asylum to peaceful meditation. I lifted up my eyes to the heavens. They were unclouded and serene. I imagined I felt the presence of the Deity smiling on my sacrifice, and already offering me a reward in the consolatory peace of a celestial abode. Tears of delight flowed gently down my cheeks. I repeated my vows with holy ecstasy and went to bed again to take the slumber of God's chosen children. Here, in the society of young girls of various ages, Manon remained for a year. Her womanly conduct and intellectual acquirements very soon gained her the favor and affection of the whole sisterhood, and the association of the young ladies placed under their tuition. She never mingled in the sports of younger companions, nor the recreations of older ones, much preferring to steal away by herself in some remote corner of the garden, with her books, or pacing the avenues to enjoy in quiet rapture the sight of blooming flowers, quivering leaves, or trailing branches of the shade trees, and the fleecy clouds flitting over the blue space above her, narrowly bounded by the high convent walls. Every other moment was busily employed with her books, romances, legends, lives of the saints, biography, travels, history, political philosophy, poetry. Nothing escaped the grasp of her active mind. The nuns, to whose care she was committed, were proud of her progress. 
her music and drawing masters were equally profuse in the praises of a pupil who never allowed an obstacle to check her rapid advance caressed loved and commended without measure she had good sense enough not to be spoiled she was the especial favorite of an antiquated sister of seventy years whose diminutive figure preciseness of manner and affectation of sanctity which nevertheless concealed a warm heart made an indelible impression on the lively imagination of her thoughtful pupil she led her away to her own dimly lighted cell and there chatted for hours with the young listener who received the old nun's lessons or tales with an avidity redoubled by the solitude of the cell. Her influence assisted to sharpen Manon's already too active emotions, and imparted such a degree of intensity to her religious fervor that when the season for communion arrived the child was so overcome that she could not support herself, and was carried to the altar by the nuns. Everything within the convent contributed to nourish and increase the unhealthy excitement of Manon's sensitive nature. The event of a young girl taking the white veil occurred some months after her entrance into the convent. The sight of the church and altar decorated with flowers and enriched with silken draperies, the brilliant lights, the gaily dressed crowd that assembled to witness the ceremony, above all the entombed bride with her white veil, rolling volumes of dark hair, the crown of roses, the pale, beautiful, downcast face, excited the sympathy of the affectionate Manon and when the bridal dress was exchanged for one of somber hue, her head dismantled of its crowning beauty, and her form extended with folding hands beneath a black pall. The excited child, imagining herself in the place of the victim, could no longer repress her emotions, and burst into an uncontrollable paroxysm of tears. Such scenes, the daily sights and sounds of vesper bells, the hooded monks and shrouded nuns in the taper-lighted chapel, the gloomy burials at night by torchlight, were all fitted to oppress the child's spirit with awe, and fill her with yearnings for secluded holiness and death, instead of healthy, active exertion in behalf of mankind. It was an excessive and mistaken religious zeal, which she threw off with its imposing and beguiling rites, for the other extreme of philosophy and infidelity, when arrived at womanhood. There was but one among the inmates of the convent, who Manon singled out as her friend and confidant, one for whom she always maintained an unchanged attachment. The usual quiet routine of convent life was broken one day by the arrival of two young ladies, an event that excited the curiosity of the young girls shut out from the world. Who are they? What are they like? were questions that sped unanswered from lip to lip of a group in the garden, bent upon a scrutiny of the two young ladies led thither by the superior. One was eighteen, finely formed, of proud but easy carriage, with a face that had strong claims to beauty when not disfigured by an expression of discontent and fretfulness. She had previously completed her convent education, but was returned by her mother in order to put in check her ungovernable temper, and to accompany her younger, more amiable, and timid sister. The latter, fourteen, with a modest air and sweet countenance bathed in tears, attracted the sympathy and love of the impressible Manon the moment their eyes met. From the day of Sophia's arrival the two were inseparable. Sophia was henceforth the receptacle of all the dreams, the aspirations, and the philosophical musings of the mature child, wearied and overburdened with the pent-up thoughts and emotions daily crowding into her mind and heart. This was not a transient schoolgirl friendship. It was one sustained in an unfailing correspondence after their separation. Madame Roland owed as much of the facility and clearness of expression visible in her writings to the frequent letters she early exchanged with her friend as to the habitual practice of taking notes from the books she perused, and interlining them with her own thoughts and opinions. When the year of her stay at the convent had expired, her mother placed her under the care of her grandmother Philippon, a graceful, good-humored woman of sixty-five years, still possessing agreeable manners, and an occasional mirthfulness that made her a favorite with the young. But her prominent characteristic was the precision with which she enforced and observed decorum, the little courtesies and elegances of manner were of the highest importance in her judgment. Her unpretending, pleasant home was on the banks of the Seine, commanding a lively view of the winding river, and a wide landscape beyond. This was a charming retreat where Manon could indulge her meditative, studious habits to her heart's content. Every morning she attended Mass with her great aunt Angelica, a worthy maiden, asthmatic and devout, as virtuous as an angel, and as simple as a child and entirely devoted to her elder sister with whom she lived. A third sister, Madame Besnard, came frequently to visit them, 
always keeping up an air of ceremony and formality that greatly exceeded even Madame Philippon. Manon was most frequently the theme of their conversation, Madame Besnard insisting with a shrug of the shoulders that the child would be spoiled, while the good Angelica, meek, quiet, and pale, busy with her spectacles and knitting, assured the two precise old ladies that Manon had good sense enough to take care of herself, and continued to pet her as before. Madame Philippon was so delighted and proud of her granddaughter's accomplishments that she was induced to display her talent and prettiness before a wealthy lady of whose children she had formerly been governess. Accordingly, Manon was decked in holiday dress, and the greatest preparation and care bestowed upon her appearance. Arriving at the mansion, they were greeted by the servants with the greatest respect, and as they passed on, the maids, attracted by the long dark ringlets and blooming cheeks of the young visitor, ventured to compliment her. Manon's pride rose at the familiarity and without replying she followed her ceremonious grandmother to the elegant apartments of Madame Bosmarel. The lady received them in a cold, condescending tone of voice, without rising, and continued the embroidery upon which she was engaged. She addressed her dignified visitor with the flippant title of Mademoiselle, and openly remarked upon Madame's blooming face. The indignant girl's countenance was suffused with blushes, and her heart swelled with scorn and resentment that her venerated grandmother should be regarded with so little respect, and that she herself, conscious of superior worth and aspiring to the nobleness of a Roman maiden, should be looked down upon by this arrogant lady, and treated as an equal by her servants. Manon was glad when the interview terminated, and retreated with her pulse throbbing, and her face crimsoned with mortified pride and anger. Again under their own humble roof, she returned to her studies, her head teeming with speculations upon the inequality of rank, that awakened from their long sleep the prejudices of her childhood. At the expiration of a year, Manon returned to the parental roof. Her music and dancing masters were recalled, and she resumed her studies with more assiduity than ever. Every book within her reach was carefully perused. Locke, Pascal, Berlimac, Montesquieu, Voltaire were familiar authors. An occasional poem or a romance relieved her severer studies. The long winter evening she spent beside her mother with her needlework, or read aloud, to which, however, she had a decided aversion, as it prevented the close inquiry and study she indulged when poring over the pages by herself. She had the use of a library belonging to the Abbe Leger, a warm-hearted old man with little else to recommend him, but with whom Gretien Philippon and his family spent their Sabbath evenings. The Abbe's household was superintended by a distant relative, Mademoiselle Danache. She was a source of infinite amusement to the discerning Manon. Advanced in years, yet preserving a youthful style of dress, tall, thin, and sallow, with a shrill voice forever recounting her pedigree, of which she was intolerably proud, possessing no talent but for a stingy economy and scolding. She was destined to become one of Manon's attaches, and as inseparable as her own shadow for a year and a half. The Abbe Leger, terminating his own life, left his poor relative without a home. Madame Philippon had compassion for her solitary condition, and offered her an asylum till the suit she had instituted for the recovery of an uncle's property was decided. During this time Manon was her secretary. She wrote letters and petitions for her, and often accompanied her when she went to intercede with influential persons. Mademoiselle Danache was extremely illiterate and ill-bred. She therefore depended upon Manon's ready tact on all occasions, but when they went together on these errands, the young philosopher was filled with disgust and contempt on seeing the obsequious attentions her whimsical, ignorant friend received, the moment the ready names of her long line of titled ancestry dropped from her nimble tongue, with as good effect as if they had been pearls falling from the lips of beauty, while she, the one of true nobility, stood unnoticed and slighted, feeling her superiority and revolving in her busy mind the absurd and unjust institutions of society. End of section 38 Recording by Matthew Rees, Davenport, Iowa Of the Heroines of History This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Matthew Rees The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins Madame Roland, Part 2
At fifteen, Manon was graceful and pleasing. Her face was attractive from its varying expression, frank, lively, and tender, often lofty and serious. The irregularity of her features was atoned for by her clear, fresh complexion and the brilliancy of her hazel eyes. Modest and reserved, an inferior person would scarcely have suspected her strong talents, but when she came in contact with cultivated minds, she was transformed from a timid, blushing maiden to a brilliant, self-possessed woman with a soul that beamed through every feature, giving animation and indisputable beauty to a face that otherwise would have been plain. Thinking to amuse her, Madame Philippon decided upon a trip to Versailles accompanied by Mademoiselle Danache and an uncle, an amiable young clergyman as an escort. They occupied apartments in the palace, which happened to be vacated by one of the Dauphiness women, and amused themselves with being spectators of the royal public and private dinners, and witnessing some of the splendors of palace life. Mademoiselle Danache, by her forward airs and noisy thrusting of her pedigree in the face of everyone who opposed her passage, drew attention upon the little party wherever they went, much to Manon's mortification. She looked thoughtfully upon the gaily dressed crowds about her, despised the fawning courtiers, and gazed with indignation upon the grand fetes, the brilliant equipages, and the luxuriant apartments of the palace, contrasting them with the squalid homes and the pale emaciated crowds that went forth in daily labor, and from whom was wrenched half their scanty pittance to support this splendor. Neither could her high spirit brook the notice of menials and the slights of court sycophants, whom she felt to be immeasurably beneath her. Instead of being amused with the daily show, she wandered away to the gardens to forget her disgust, in admiration of the flowers and the statues that graced them. Yet even there was tormented with thoughts of depotism and oppression, and sighed that she had not been born a Grecian maiden. Her mother, observing Manon's abstraction, asked how she enjoyed the visit. I shall be glad when it is ended, was her characteristic reply, else in a few more days I shall so detest all the persons I see that I shall not know what to do with my hatred. Why, what harm have these persons done you? said Madame Philippon. They make me feel injustice and look upon absurdity, replied the young sage. She was happy to be buried again in the retirement of her own home. Sophia Canet, her friend of the convent, having arrived at Paris with her brother, drew Manon more into society, and enabled her to meet people of rank, whose ignorance and supercilious airs she often had occasion to despise, and also gave her friends among authors and people of distinguished talent. She had attained an age and attractiveness that could not escape attention, and thenceforth Manon had numberless suitors who, according to the customs of France, were first obliged to apply to her parents, an embarrassing ceremony that was most frequently performed by letter-writing. In consequence, suitors were often dismissed by her father, whom she had never seen. She was satisfied to judge of them by the tone of the application, and concurred in the dismission of one tradesman after another, often writing the replies herself, which were carefully copied and sent by her father. When a wealthy jeweler appeared, Philippon was caught by the glitter of his occupation and his promising prospects of accumulating a large fortune. He urged upon Manon the expediency of accepting this suitor but she was dissatisfied with his attainments, and assured her parents she could only be happy with one whom she could look upon as her equal or superior. This refusal occasioned the beginning of the estrangement between herself and father, which was never reconciled. Upon the appearance of a young physician, her parents thought the aspiring Manon would not hesitate to accept one of a profession that involved some degree of learning. Her mother, whose declining health made her anxious to see her daughter happily provided with a home, concerted with the young doctor to win Manon's affections. A first interview was carefully arranged. Madame Philippon conducted her daughter, as if unpremeditated, to the house of a friend, where the enamoured suitor happened in by chance, of course. The profuse compliments of the inexperienced physician and the sly hints and meaning smiles of the ladies who accompanied him soon betrayed the whole plan to the penetrating Manon, and caused her to look with infinite contempt upon the silly artifices of her admirer. She consented, however, to her mother's urgent entreaties to receive his visits and decide more leisurely, but a farther acquaintance betrayed his superficial acquirements, and the girl, whose intellect was to be won instead of her heart, gave him as decided a refusal as those who had gone before. In vain her father raged and stormed, and even the tender sad pleadings of her invalid mother could not change her determination. "'Do not reject a husband,' 
said her mother, who it is true does not possess the refinement you desire, but who will love you and with whom you can be happy. As happy as you have been, exclaimed Manon in her excitement, referring to the utter disunion of spirit between her father and mother. Madame Philippon's face was pale with painful emotion, and she never urged the subject again. Not long after, Manon returned hastily from a visit, filled with presentiments of evil, and found her mother suddenly ill, and unable to speak. A priest was summoned to perform the last rites, and Manon, sobbing violently, stood by the deathbed holding a taper. Her mother smiled upon her, and smoothed her cheek affectionately, till, overcome with the intensity of her grief, she fell senseless to the floor. The light was extinguished, and when she again recovered, her mother was no more. The violence of her unchecked sorrow occasioned an illness from which her recovery was long doubtful. An excursion and soothing visit to her Aunt Angelica somewhat restored her cheerfulness, but her home was no longer what it had been. Her father was rapidly pursuing a career of dissipation, to which his infidel principles gave loose reins, his business neglected, his little fortune rapidly vanishing, ensnaring in the toils of one not endeared by sacred ties, and whom he installed the quiet household all contributed to repel his daughter's affection. She endeavored to forget her grief and her melancholy in her retired chamber, where nearly all her time was passed, absorbed in books and writing manuscripts which never met any eyes but her own. While thus solitary and desponding, a letter from her early friend Sophia announced a visitor of whom she had often heard. Roland de la Platière belonged to an opulent family of Amiens, and held the important office of inspector of manufactures. During his leisure he had written several treatises on political economy that had gained him some celebrity in the world. He was fond of study, and was something of a philosopher. In his frequent visits to the house of Monsieur Canet, he had seen Manon's portrait, and often listened to Sophia's eulogies upon her accomplished friend, and had read her letters. His interest was excited in the enthusiastic and talented girl, and he entreated a letter of introduction that he might be enabled to see her during his occasional trips to Paris. He accordingly presented himself at the first opportunity. Manon was prepared to judge of him by the sketch justly drawn by Sophia. "'You will receive this letter,' wrote her friend, "'by the hand of the philosopher of whom I have so often written you. Monsieur Roland is an enlightened man, of antique manners, without reproach, except for his passion for the ancients, his contempt for the moderns, and his too high estimation of himself.' Manon found herself in the presence of one who she describes as tall, slender and well-formed, but negligent in his carriage, and with that stiffness which is often contracted by study. Yet his manners were simple and easy, and without possessing the fashionable graces, he combined the politeness of a well-bred man with the gravity of a philosopher. He was thin, with a complexion much tanned. His broad intellectual brow, covered with but a few hairs, added to the imposing attractiveness of regular features. When listening, his countenance expressed deep thoughtfulness, and often sadness, but once interested and animated in conversation, his face was lighted with lively and winning smiles. His voice was masculine, his language monotonous and harsh, but the sentiments he expressed so perfectly accorded with Manon's views that she felt herself attracted by a sympathy as new as it was delightful. Though his severe and practical mind admitted none of the beautiful dreams of the visionary world that added so much to Manon's happiness, there was yet that sameness of high ambition to be the benefactor of the human race, a conscious superiority over those whose rank gave them higher places, and a contempt for the frivolous pursuits of life, that perfectly harmonized their minds, though the heart of neither was touched. Manon regarded him as a superior being, an oracle to whom she was willing to submit her judgment, while he, flattered by the succumbing of her brilliant mind to his, regarded her with placid and paternal admiration. Upon M. Roland's departure from Paris, he left with his new friend voluminous manuscripts, containing a journal of recent travels in Germany, with sage reflections that rendered them doubly interesting to Manon. In their perusal, she became initiated in his thoughts and feelings to a far greater extent than conversation could ever have afforded her. Eighteen months elapsed before they met again. In the meantime, Roland traveled through Italy, Switzerland, Sicily, and Malta, writing copious notes and forwarding them at regular intervals to Manon who studied them with an avidity and interest that prepared her to hail his return with joy and veneration nearly allied to worship. Yet there was not a spark of love growing in her bosom. It was only her intellect that singled him out from the rest of the world. 
several years passed in friendly correspondence or interviews during which they discussed political reforms philosophy and science and various literary projects with a frankness confidence and pleasure that before they were aware of it each became necessary to the other's happiness m roland at length declared his attachment manon frankly acknowledged that she esteemed him more highly than any one she ever met yet her circumstances were so humble her father's errors would be a source of disgrace and mortification and the well-known pride of the Roland family, who might feel dishonored by the alliance, were reasons for which her proud spirit shrank from a union otherwise unobjectionable. M. Roland would not yield to these representations, and finally elicited her consent. From that moment the reliance, trust, and affection she had not known since her mother's death again nestled in her heart, and she was happy. M. Roland returned to Amiens, and then addressed a letter to her father to obtain his consent to their marriage. M. Philippon replied in an insulting tone, and bluntly refused him. Manon, surprised and grieved, immediately wrote to her revered friend, and besought him to think no more of the affair, and not to expose himself to farther affronts by new solicitations. At the same time, she assured her father she would marry no one else, secured a small remnant of her mother's fortune, and retired to the same convent where a year of her childhood had passed. In a narrow little room, close under the roof where the snow lay piled up, or the rain pattered dismally, without a companion, obliged to live with the strictest frugality, with no friendly voice to dispel the settled silence. Here Manon lived, enjoying a peaceful, quiet happiness in the midst of literary labors that no mere seeker of pleasure ever found in the delirious whirl of gaiety or in luxurious idleness. The comfortless surroundings of uncurtained windows, bare floor, dim light, and scanty fire could not depress her spirit but rather lent new and stronger wings to an imagination that continually roamed to the ends of the earth or far back into bygone ages, and brought therefrom abundant lessons to revolve. Disciplined by the particular circumstances of her life, and accustomed to live within herself, she was least alone when alone. She daily prepared her own frugal food, never went out except on the occasion of a weekly visit to her father's house to mend his linen and to have a care for his interests and received no visitors beside one of the sisters in the convent, who was limited to an hour in the evening. Who would have dreamed, in passing the quiet convent, that by the light shining dimly from the high window under the eaves sat a solitary maiden, unconsciously pruning her intellect for a bold patriotic appeal that was to shake the throne of France, unknowingly preparing herself to sway the deliberations of statesmen, and destined to tread in stately and conscious worth the halls of a palace? She lost no time in useless repinings, but applied herself vigorously and diligently to the cultivation of such talents as God had committed to her, without questioning the future, dark and gloomy enough to her lonely eyes. It was unfortunate that she had no guide to lead her out of the mazes in which she had lost her way, after rejecting the Catholic creed, as hollow and heartless, with the outward forms but not the essence of spirituality. Yet she dared reveal her doubts to no one and still preserved outward conformity to her mother's belief. Here M. Roland again visited her, at the expiration of five or six months. He presented himself at the convent one day, and beheld Manon's pale face behind the grating, which, with the sweet sound of her voice, revived the affection that had nearly died out when he ceased to think of her as his intended bride. Touched by her lonely condition and her faithfulness to him, he urgently renewed his suit. Manon hesitated. She no longer cherished the romantic love with which she regarded him at their last parting, and her pride and vanity were wounded that he had endured a refusal he knew to be against her inclination with such unlover-like apathy. Farther consideration, however, suggested the compliment his deliberate decision paid her, and the sacrifice of family considerations his renewed offer implied. Manon no longer deliberated. She resolutely placed her hand in his, and though more intellect than heart went with it, M. Roland was satisfied and happy. Their marriage occurred in 1780. Manon, still youthful at twenty-five, was at length wedded to an austere, self-confident, overbearing man, twenty years her senior. The first year was spent in Paris, entirely occupied in the preparation of a work on the arts, in which Madame Roland untiringly assisted her husband. Her only recreation was attending a course of lectures on natural history and botany. She secluded herself from her friends, not from her own choice, but because her imperious husband demanded it. He wished to absorb her attention and affection entirely in himself. The succeeding four years were passed at Amiens, 
occupied as before in literary pursuits, to which Madame Roland lent her own pen with a brilliancy of style that gave an additional reputation to Roland's works. The birth of a daughter divided her cares and pursuits, but she had become so indispensable to her husband that for the sake of her grateful presence he was quite ready to submit to the mischievous play of little fingers among his books and papers. The sunny face of Eudora peeping out from her long flaxen ringlets, now and then laughingly thrust between her father's face and his endless manuscripts, did much towards softening his habitual sternness. Madame Roland, too, centered in this sweet child the affections that were but rudely and selfishly cherished by her exacting husband. It was in the course of this stay at Emmions that Monsieur Roland applied for letters patent of nobility, wishing to resume the title of his ancestry, now that his wealth was sufficient to support such rank. His wife was not unwilling to bear the gracious title of Lady Roland, in spite of her previous contempt of titled nobility, and meditations upon the inequality of mankind. It was a temptation neither of them would have rejected, had their application been successful. In 1785, Monsieur Roland removed to the city of Lyon. The family occupied a winter residence in town, but passed the summers upon a fine paternal estate a few miles from Lyon. La Platière was a rural retreat, lying in the valley of the Somme, at the foot of the mountains of Beaujolais. It was a wild, romantic region, intersected with deep gorges and watered by impetuous torrents, that leapt and foamed down the mountainsides, then rushing noisily through the fertile valley, swelled the wide rolling Saône to overflowing. Fruitful vineyards grew purple in the warm sheltered valley, and the smooth green meadows were dotted with flocks of white sheep guarded by shepherds. In the midst of these meadows and vineyards stretched the La Platière farm, with its sleek cattle, its dovecotes, fish ponds, gardens and groups of willows with their long sweeping boughs and tall prim poplars shading the solid square stone house and its numberless outhouses. The mansion, spacious and airy, had nothing to recommend it in the way of ornamental architecture. A plain front, the roof projecting and nearly flat, regular windows, and a plain portico at the entrance, told more of unpretending comfort than taste or display. Madame Roland, accustomed only to a life among brick and mortar, regarded La Platière with enthusiastic admiration. She could scarcely find words to express her joy on finding herself possessed of such a secluded, charming retreat as she had often pictured in her dreams. But every cup has its drop of gall. M. Roland's mother and brother still occupied the estate. One, proud, tyrannical, and possessing the enviable characteristics of a shrew. The other, gruff, coarse, and surly, kept discord perpetually awake. The mother's turbulent spirit was soon hushed in the unregretted sleep of death an event that decided the Roland family to occupy their estate throughout the year. Five years of undisturbed happiness succeeded. Madame Roland's time was divided between the systematic regulation of domestic duties, the education of their only and idolized child, Eudora, and the reception of much company attracted by the scientific celebrity of Monsieur Roland. Beside all these time-consuming demands, she secured two hours during the day to pass in her husband's study, assisting him in his literary pursuits, with her ready and popular pen, that gained him many an eulogium. Happy in lending her talents to secure his renown rather than her own, and capable of an entire devotion to his comfort and happiness, more from a sense of duty and veneration than the promptings of love, she passed those five years in an uninterrupted tranquillity that seemed a rest to her tired spirit, a preparation, a gathering of strength for the tempestuous life that followed. End of section 39 Recording by Matthew Reese, Davenport, Iowa. Section 40 of the Heroines of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Reese. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Madame Roland, Part Three. In 1790, the low but fearful rumblings of the political storm that had long been gathering over France boomed through the cities, along the valleys, echoed through the mountain hamlets, and sounded in the ears of those hidden in distant and obscure retreats. Monsieur Roland and his wife, aroused at the welcome tones of the first murmurings of liberty, hastened to Lyon, where the contest had arisen with powerful excitement. Madame Roland's saloons were thrown open, and the most prominent of the revolutionary party gathered there to discuss the principles to be adopted. 
Madame Roland engaged in their counsels, guided their decisions by eloquent and burning words that fell from her lips with irresistible fascination. Her ardor stimulated their zeal. Her impassioned appeals fired them with new and daring efforts to shake off the oppressive yoke of kingly aristocracy. Thus conspicuously arrayed against the royalists, Monsieur Roland's name was upon every lip, with praises on one side and bitter denunciations on the other, a hostility that nerved his wife with a stronger enthusiasm, and absorbed all the powers of her indefatigable mind in the one idea and aim of universal freedom. Louis the Sixteenth, irresolute and yielding, attempted to conciliate the stormy populace and to avert the accumulating vengeance of years from his devoted head. But the iniquities of his predecessors and the surrounding nobility were destined to be visited on this monarch, too weak, too undiscerning, to arrest the furious passions he blindly tampered with. To appease the multitude, he convened the National Assembly. This body consisted of the nobility, the higher clergy, and representatives from all parts of the nation. M. Roland, the favorite and leading man of the revolutionary party in the city of Lyon, was elected their representative by a large majority. On the 20th of February, 1791, he repaired to Paris with his wife, who a few years before sat a homeless, obscure maiden in a desolate garret, but now brilliant, wealthy, and influential, was the worshipped heroine of the Republican Party. She daily attended the sittings of the Assembly and listened with intense interest to the exciting debates. The refined and courtly bearing, the polished and cultivated language of the Royalists, struck her favorably, in contrast with the coarse plebeian manners and illiterate speech of the Democrats. But, though her tastes would have inclined her to the former, the latter involved her principles, and contrast only served to increase her ardent wish for the education and refinement of the lower classes. Before the close of the first sitting of the assembly, the nobility were vanquished, and the royal family were compelled to abandon their palaces at Versailles and remain in Paris. The contest assumed a new phase being sustained between the Girondists and Jacobins, one party intent upon the preservation of the throne, limited in its power by a free constitution, the other fiercely bent upon the overthrow of the altar, the throne, the distinctions of nobility, and every barrier that prevented the entire equality of all classes. M. Roland and his wife zealously supported the former. The leading and most intelligent of the Girondists assembled four evenings in the week, at the home of M. Roland, attracted by his integrity and calm, deliberate wisdom, as well as by the more fascinating conversational powers of his brilliant wife, to whose opinions they paid the most sincere and flattering deference. Among those who frequented her saloons was a young lawyer of repulsive appearance, stupid and awkward, possessed of an obstinate temper utterly devoid of sensitiveness, caring as little for applause as the hisses of contempt with which his long, dry speeches were invariably received in the assembly. Madame Roland alone discovered genius in the sullen, moody young man. She saw the energy, the rock-like fixedness of purpose, the hatred of luxury and aristocracy that would make him a favorite with the multitude, and feeling him to be a dangerous enemy, yet not a friend to be trusted, she welcomed him to her circle more from policy than choice. He listened entranced to the eloquent voice and clear reasoning of the intrepid Madame Roland, and bowed in awe to her high-souled principles, yet was ready to aim a deadly blow at them, and at her who gave them utterance, when ambition or interest suggested. This was Robespierre. Abbott says of his admiration of that accomplished woman, he studied Madame Roland with even more of stoical apathy than another man would study a book which he admires. The next day he would give utterance in the assembly, not only to the sentiments, but even to the very words and phrases which he had carefully garnered from the exuberant diction of his eloquent instructress. Occasionally every eye would be riveted upon him, and every ear attentive, as he gave utterance to some lofty sentiment in impassioned language which had been heard before in sweeter tones from more persuasive lips. On one occasion, in the early part of his career, having laid himself under the displeasure of the multitude, and exposed to accusation from the assembly, Madame Roland found him a place of security, and pled for him with an influential member of the assembly, till his defense was promised. Robespierre escaped to become the assassin of his benefactors. In September 1791, the assembly was dissolved, and Monsieur Roland and his wife retired from Paris. The two or three months of seclusion that succeeded, rather inspired them for new efforts than made them forget the perils of France. A new assembly convened in November, and though the previous members could not be re-elected, 
Monsieur and Madame Roland determined to return to Paris and share the danger and excitement daily increasing in the metropolis. The most influential and learned men from all parts of the nation gathered there to watch the shaping of events that every moment assumed a more threatening aspect. Clubs were formed to discuss the momentous questions of the times, and every evening various private saloons were the scenes of exciting and intensely interesting debate. The position and influence of the Rolands is thus described. Monsieur Roland was grave, taciturn, oracular. He had no brilliance of talent to excite envy. He displayed no ostentation in dress or equipage or manners to provoke the desire in others to humble him. His reputation for stoical virtue gave a wide sweep to his influence. His very silence invested him with a mysterious wisdom. Consequently, no one feared him as a rival, and he was frequently thrust forward as the unobjectionable head of a party by all who hoped, through him, to promote their own interests. He was what we call in America an available candidate. Madame Roland, on the contrary, was animated and brilliant. Her genius was universally admired. Her bold suggestions, her shrewd counsel, her lively repartee, her capability of cutting sarcasm, rarely exercised, her deep and impassioned benevolence, her unvarying cheerfulness, the sincerity and enthusiasm of her philanthropy, and the unrivaled brilliance of her conversational powers, made her the center of a system around which the brightest intellects were revolving. Virginon, Petion, Brissot, and others whose names were then comparatively unknown, but whose fame has since resounded through the civilized world, loved to do her homage. With such elements of popularity, it is not surprising that they were elevated to a position in which the prisoner king was obliged to place them to appease the stormy populace. Murders were nightly committed. The terrified nobles were hastily escaping with their families. Confusion and death reigned everywhere. There was no expedient left the monarch but to accede to the demands of the people, dismiss his ministry, and replace it by Republican candidates. M. Roland was immediately selected by the Girondists as Minister of the Interior, a post scarcely inferior to the crown itself, and especially elevated at this moment when only the shadow of authority remained with the king. M. Roland and his wife immediately occupied the palace which had been the recipient of Neckar, but a short time before and furnished by him with regal splendor. At last the scornful Manon was the mistress of one of those magnificent palaces, was elevated to an equality with kings and princes, and rolled through the thoroughfares of Paris in one of the very gilded coaches that had excited her childish contempt. Madame Roland, however, was in a position that rightly belonged to her, and which she filled with unaffected grace and dignity. She found full scope for her abundant talents, so assiduously cultivated in her youth an opportunity for the magnanimous exercise of her forgiving and generous temper. On one occasion, after leaving her elegant dining hall, where she had entertained the greatest men in France, she found in the saloon an old man who, with profound respect, begged an interview with the Minister of the Interior. She discovered in him a haughty aristocrat, who many years before had humiliated her proud spirit by leaving her, on the occasion of a visit, to dine with the menials. She exulted in her own thoughts at the reversed position in which they now stood, but generously restrained any manifestation of her triumph. From all the splendid apartments of the palace, Madame Roland selected a small, retired room, furnished as a library, and where she spent nearly all her time. Here gathered the influential members of the assembly, discussing the momentous affairs of state, occasionally turning to consult her, while she sat at a little distance at a small work-table, occupied with her needle or pen. Here she wrote the proclamations, the state papers, and the letters which were presented to the king in assembly in M. Roland's name, securing to him the enthusiastic admiration alone due to herself. The Jacobin party were every day increasing in strength, and ready to pour from the cellars and haunts of vice with which Paris was thronged, numberless advocates of their ferocious measures. The king had already been insulted in his palace by the mob. The royalists had fled to Coblenz, and were preparing to march with the Prussian army to reinstate the French monarch, a movement which filled both the Girondists and Jacobins with alarm. Louis, irresolute and vacillating, took no decided measures. He endeavored to conciliate all parties, and thus gain the confidence and support of none. At this crisis, Madame Roland, in behalf of the Girondists and in the name of the minister, addressed a bold and eloquent letter to the king, demanded him to proclaim war against the emigrants, 
and take instant measures to prevent their mediated attack, in union with the Prussians, upon Paris. By thus cooperating with the Girondists, his crown might be saved, though his power would be limited, while if he opposed them, his downfall and horrible anarchy must ensue. The letter, written with glowing and impassioned eloquence, was given by M. Roland to the king on the 11th of June, 1792. Its proposed decree was too unpalatable to the monarch, the truth which it contained too plain for the royal ear. He commented upon it by peremptorily dismissing M. Roland from office. "'Here am I dismissed from office,' exclaimed the deposed minister to his wife on entering her library. "'Present your letter to the assembly, that the nation may see for what counsel you have been dismissed,' replied the intrepid Madame Roland. The letter was presented. It received unbounded applause from the assembly, and was ordered to be printed and scattered throughout every department in France. It was a firebrand, thrown among combustibles. The rapturous applause of millions followed the hero to the obscure retreat which Madame Roland selected in a retired street of the metropolis. But here they were sought out, and their apartments thronged with the admiring adherence of both parties. The Girondists, now no longer willing to support the king, openly proposed the establishment of a republic. Danger hourly increased. The populace, incensed at the removal of M. Roland, attacked the Tuileries, insulted the monarch and the royal family, and, in every possible way, vented their rage and hatred. Louis was obliged to consent to the reinstatement of the Republican minister, and again M. Roland and his wife occupied the magnificent palace from which they had suddenly been expelled. The arrest and imprisonment of Louis the Sixteenth soon after caused M. Roland to send in his resignation to the assembly, since the office he held was virtually annulled. He could now have escaped with his wife from the frightful scenes daily enacting in the streets of Paris, but her courageous spirit would not recoil from danger or death, so long as a hope remained of rescuing France from threatened anarchy. The rapid approach of the Prussian army terrified all parties. The Jacobins, having obtained the ascendancy of power in Paris, and determined to save themselves from the vengeance of the advancing army, ordered every man in Paris capable of bearing arms to prepare to advance to the frontiers, and repulse the emigrant royalists and their allies. In order to ensure this decree, and to rid themselves of all who were secretly ready to fall upon them when encouraged by the near approach of the army, the gates of Paris were closed, and at night every house in the metropolis was entered by parties of Jacobins, its apartments and most secret recesses searched, victims dragged forth from every possible place of concealment, and horribly murdered. Everyone who gave the slightest suspicion of favoring the royalists were instantly put to death. The innocent and guilty perished together. Homes were deluged with the blood of helpless and innocent victims. Fathers perished with their helpless children. Beautiful women were dragged to the guillotine. The prisons were crowded with trembling victims, who were one after another beheaded in the courtyards, till the pavements ran with blood. Fiends, thirsting for the heart's blood of both friend and foe, prowled through the streets, sheathing their daggers in human flesh at every step. This frightful massacre continued till every royalist had fallen. And now the frenzied Jacobins fixed their bloody fangs upon the Girondists. A fierce struggle for supremacy in the convention ensued. It was more than a political reaching after power, more than patriotic fervor that inspired the eloquent addresses at the tribune. It was a struggle for life. One party or the other must lay their heads beneath the axe. The Jacobins attempted to strike a deadly blow at the Girondists by bringing an accusation against their inspiring genius, Madame Roland. A spy was employed to ingratiate himself in her confidence, and, by perverting her expressions, obtain her accusation and bring her to the scaffold. She quickly penetrated his designs and scornfully repulsed his friendship. He, however, charged her with carrying on a secret correspondence with exiled royalists, and she was summoned before the tribunal. A vast assemblage awaited the entrance of the woman whose fame had sounded throughout Europe, and whose influence had so strongly wielded the assembly. Everyone was anxious and curious to behold the wonderful being who, retaining a feminine seclusion, yet breathed through manly lips a thrilling patriotism worthy of a Roman orator. At the instant she appeared, a respectful silence pervaded the assemblage. Old man and young, friend and enemy, even Robespierre and Marat, watched with undisguised admiration the majestic bearing, yet womanly loveliness and modesty, with which this noble woman advanced and stood before the bar. 
Her replies to the President were full of dignity and frankness, uttered in sweet, clear tones that fell with a magical effect upon the listeners. Every answer exposed more clearly the villainy and falsehood of her accuser, and when she tremulously began her own defense, gathering courage as she spoke, till the eloquence and fervor of her exalted spirit was showered in words of fire upon the assembly, there was not an eye but was riveted upon her, not an ear but strove to catch every syllable that fell from her lips. They sat, silent and entranced, and when her voice ceased, shouts of approval rose on every side. She was acquitted both by friend and foe, and even the heartless bloodhound whose life she had saved, and who was soon to drag her to the scaffold, could not withhold a smile of approval and admiration as she glided triumphantly from among them. Four or five months of turmoil, of hatred, of frightful anarchy, heightened the unbridled and murderous passions of the populace. The Jacobins governed the assembly. The mob govern the Jacobins. The deliberations of the convention were guided by the thousands of assassins who, with upheld daggers, crowded the lobbies and surrounded the building in hoarse tumult. The death of Louis the Sixteenth was demanded, and in the midst of an exciting scene every Girondist was obliged to ascend the tribune and pronounce death upon the king, or feel the cold steel sliding quickly into his own heart. This submission did not cool the unquenchable hatred of the mob. Conspiracies were repeatedly formed to assassinate the Girondists, at one moment almost beneath the gleaming weapons in the convention, at another roused only in time to bar their doors against creeping demons, waiting the stroke of a certain hour to plunge the deadly knife in their bosoms. Madame Roland, exposed to the execrations of the populace because of her well-known position among the Girondists, was entreated to seek safety. Some devoted friends brought her the dress of a peasant girl, urging her to assume the disguise and fly with her daughter that her husband might follow her unencumbered. But she spurned to save herself thus. Throwing the dress from her, she exclaimed, I am ashamed to resort to any such expedient. I will neither disguise myself nor make any attempt at secret escape. My enemies may find me always in my place. If I am assassinated, it shall be in my own home. I owe my country an example of firmness, and I will give it. At M. Roland's resignation, they had again retired to an obscure dwelling in the Rue de la Harpe. Here, in a solitary room, they still received the agitated supporters of the Republic, in vain attempting to devise measures to stem the overwhelming tide deluging France, and gradually circling into a dizzy whirlpool that was finally to engulf both the assassin and the victim. Each day the circles grew narrower and swifter, and the Girondists, unable to escape from a vortex bearing them on to certain death, could only fortify themselves to meet it heroically. End of section 40 Recording by Matthew Rees, Davenport, Iowa Section 41 of the Heroines of History this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Reese. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Madame Roland. Part 4. On the morning of the 31st of May, 1793, a driving, rolling mist darkened the streets of Paris. Crowds of demoniac men, howling women, and reckless bloodthirsty boys blocked up the thoroughfares, adding their shouts and imprecations to the dismal tolling of bells, booming cannons, and the melancholy sound of the tocsin. The rush and the roar rolled ominously through the convulsed city. Illa suprema dies! It is our last day! exclaimed one of the illustrious Girondists. And he said it with truth. Madame Roland and her husband remained in their solitary room, listening in sickening suspense to the sounds borne even to their distant retreat, not daring to venture into the streets where their appearance would be the sure signal of death. Friends brought them tidings of events during that dreadful day. The clouds that had hung gloomily over the city since morning gathered in an early twilight. Monsieur Roland sat gloomy, unnerved and despairing, while his courageous wife, whom danger never intimidated, spoke cheerfully and hopefully even in these hours of terror. But her words were suddenly checked by the sound of brutal voices and stumbling, heavy footsteps ascending the dark stairway. In another moment, six armed men noisily burst into the apartment, and, advancing toward Monsieur Roland, 
showed him a warrant for his arrest in the name of the convention. I do not recognize the authority of your warrant, and shall not voluntarily follow you, said he to the officer. The leader replied that he had no orders to exercise violence, and should return his answer to the council, leaving a guard to secure his person. Far from being overcome with womanly fears, at this near approach of their enemies, Madame Roland was strengthened with fresh heroism. She immediately sat down and rapidly penned a glowing letter to the convention, ordered a coach, left a friend with her husband, and drove speedily to the Tuileries, where the assembly was engaged in riotous debate. A dense and murmuring crowd filled the gardens and the courts, rendering access almost impossible. Undaunted, she forced her way through, approached the sentinels who guarded the doors, and asked admission. It was refused. An instant's thought suggested a deception. Assuming the tone of the Jacobins, she assured them that she had important notes for the president that would admit of no delay in times when traitors threatened the restoration of a monarchy. The sentinel immediately permitted her to pass. Another sentinel was stationed at the door of an inner passage. I wish to see one of the messengers of the house, said she. Wait till one comes out, was the surly reply. Fifteen minutes passed that seemed hours to the impatient, anxious wife. At length she descried a messenger to whom she gave the letter, and it was immediately delivered to the president. A long hour passed, yet Madame Roland still stood at the entrance, watching with painful interest every face that came from among the excited assembly, hoping for tidings of her husband's release in reply to her appeal. But no message came, and at length, unable longer to endure suspense, she sent for one of the principal Girondists, and besought him to gain her admission to the bar, that she might speak in defense of her husband and her friends. The convention has lost all power. Your words can do no good. Violence, noise, and confusion fill the house, replied Virginal. Madame Roland abandoned the hope, and leaving her letter to speak the words she would eloquently have uttered, promised herself to return in two hours, and hastily sought her home again, to assure herself of her husband's safety. Upon entering her apartments, Monsieur Roland and the guards were nowhere to be seen. Alarmed, she inquired and searched, till she found Monsieur Roland had escaped the vigilance of his keepers, and was concealed in the house of a friend. Finding him at last, and inspiring him with new courage as her own revived, she again parted from him and returned to the Tuileries, though the midnight bell had tolled. The streets were brilliantly illuminated, but silent. And deserted. The palace and the assembly rooms were vacant. A quiet and gloomy mystery rested upon the place that a few hours before had been crowded with a mass of human beings swaying to and fro with the passions of demons grasping for new victims. Foreboding some new and horrible calamity, she turned from the palace blazing with lights and traversed the streets till the shouts and uproar of the maddened voices of a countless multitude reached her ear. A nearer approach, revealed the twenty-two Girondists of the assembly, guarded and driven before the mob, with threatened violence towards the dungeons of the conciergerie. Enough. Madame Roland knew at a glance her own fate and the doom of all she loved. A moment's delay at the Louvre to consult with a friend some means for her husband's escape, and she sped back to her own home, penned a hasty letter to Monsieur Roland, then sat quietly to scan the day's events and see the extent of her own danger. Bold, heroic, and energetic, she had preserved her cheerfulness and hope to this moment, but the remembrance of her fugitive husband, and a glance at her sleeping child resting innocently and securely upon her mother's pillow, brought with a sharp pang the thought of leaving the idolized Eudora an orphan. Her courage was gone. She threw herself beside the sweet sleeper, threw back the bright ringlets that clustered round the child's rosy face, kissed it with clinging love, and wept such tears as she had never shed before. Exhausted with grief and fatigue, she fell into a deep slumber, with her child closely clasped in her arms. It was a mother's last dear embrace. Just as the dawn of a cheerless, cloudy morning stole through the curtain windows, the rush and tramp of many feet, the clattering of steel weapons and clubs, and the hoarse howlings of a debauched multitude, aroused Madame Roland in time to meet at the door the rough leaders, who immediately announced her arrest. No tears, not a word of supplication escaped her lips. She calmly pressed a farewell kiss upon the lips of her child, 
committed her to a friend, spoke cheerfully to the weeping servants, and followed the officers with a heroic and defiant dignity that elicited their respect and protection. To secure her from the insults of the mob, one of the officers kindly proposed to close the windows of the carriage. No, she replied. Oppressed innocence should not assume the attitude of crime and shame. I do not fear the looks of honest men, and I brave those of my enemies. She calmly and pityingly gazed upon the passionate and distorted countenances of the crowd that pressed about the carriage with threatening words and gestures. They fell back, awed at her fearless bearing, and let her pass unmolested. The iron doors, bolts, and bars of the Abbaye prison closed upon Madame Roland. A bare, comfortless room, dimly lighted by a high, narrow, grated window through which the damp, chilly air crept, was given her in lieu of her own home. Nothing broke the cheerless aspect of this gloomy cell. A straw pallet lay in one corner close to the cold, moldy walls, but without uttering a word of complaint, the undaunted prisoner laid herself down upon the humble couch and fell into a deep, dreamless slumber. But a few days passed before the jailer and his kind-hearted wife were fascinated with the cheerful cordiality, the winning, gentle manners, and heroic endurance of the new prisoner. They willingly aided her in giving the cell an air of taste and comfort. At first a little table appeared, and another day the jailer's wife came in smiling and full of mystery with something concealed under her wide apron. Suddenly the table was decorated and brightened with a neat white spread, and the good little woman hastened away, pleased and proud, with Madame Roland's rewarding expressions of surprise and pleasure. Then came books, writing materials quickly followed, and lastly fresh, beautiful flowers bloomed in the grated window of her cell. Four months passed away, and the beginning of the fifth found Madame Roland cheerful and contented, strong and resolute, as when she graced the elegant saloons of a palace home. Satisfied and happy that her husband had escaped, at rest in regard to her child, safely asylumed with a friend, and hoping for the near approach of the nation's tranquillity and her consequent release, she lost not a moment in repinings or useless tears. Occupied with her books, or sketching the scenery of La Platière, and other places distinct and dear in remembrance, or writing her memoirs, she scarcely lived at all in the damp, dark cell. Her busy imagination was continually on the wing, and when recalled to her loneliness and imprisonment, by the entrance of the keeper with her coarse fare, she felt no gloom, shed no tears, but kindly greeted him and partook of the untempting food, spread upon a rusty stove to preserve the little table unsoiled, with as much liveliness and grace as if she presided at the splendid dining table of the minister of the interior. She might have possessed herself of some luxuries, but choosing rather to relieve her fellow sufferers, she distributed her money among them to obtain necessary comforts. One day two commissioners entered her cell to extort from her, if possible, the secret of her husband's retreat, since all Paris and its environs had been diligently searched for the fugitive minister. She scorned to dissimulate, and told them plainly she knew the place of his concealment, but nothing on earth could induce her to betray him. She spurned them from her. From first to last Madame Roland's defiant heroism cost her liberty and life. Her contemptuous treatment of these Jacobin inquisitors determined her fate. She was too illustrious, too eloquent, too fearless a woman to be suffered to live. But it was necessary to convict her on a new charge in order to bring her to the scaffold. The following day an officer entered and announced to Madame Roland that her liberty was restored. Scarcely believing her senses, she emerged from her prison, joyfully breathed the free air again, and accustomed her eyes to the blinding light of day, scarcely less bewildering than the exultation of being free of clasping her child to her heart and claiming her own home. Ordering a carriage to drive quickly to the Rue de la Harpe, it was not long before she alighted at her own door, her face beaming with the expected happiness of hearing again the voice of Eudora. She eagerly bounded up the steps and opened the door. Her foot was upon the threshold, when two men darted from places of concealment, seized and rudely thrust her back into the carriage, with the assurance that the assembly had issued a new warrant for her arrest. They bore her to the prison of St. Pelagie, and conducted her to a loathsome dungeon already crowded with the most abandoned women and desperate villains, whose repulsive aspect made her shudder and shrink from the vile contact. Her courage no longer supported her. The disappointment had been too cruel. She sat down amidst the miserable wretches of the dungeon, and wept and sobbed with uncontrollable sorrow. 
but here as in the other prison she gained the sympathy of her keepers who soon ventured to remove her to a narrow cell by herself as before her room gradually assumed an unexpected degree of comfort books music drawing and writing were made available by the kindness of madame beauchot the wife of the jailer flowers and vines twisted among and hid the ugly iron bars across the high window and a small table and comfortable bed completed all her wants once more she gathered calmness and happiness from her employments she could utter with triumph what marie antoinette exclaimed in despair what a resource amid the calamities of life is a highly cultivated mind on the same day when the girondists were executed october thirty first seventeen ninety three Madame Roland was led to the dungeons of the conciergerie. This frightful prison lay beneath the palace of justice. A wide flight of stone steps led down to the subterraneous passages that wound and twisted and intersected each other like caged serpents, and terminated in cells, cold, dark, and silent as the grave. The atmosphere was humid and noxious. Moisture oozed from the walls, and the damp, slippery floors made the bewildered captive recoil from a footing that suggested a path among sliding lizards and creeping scorpions. Through these dark labyrinths, the heroic Girondists and the hapless queen had passed forth to a repulsive, bloody death. Ladies distinguished for beauty and talent, young girls fair and innocent, noble men and their aged fathers, bowed and trembling under the snowy crown of years, had gone forth daily to appease the mad multitude thirsting for human blood. Still agonizing groans resounded through the gloomy corridors, or sometimes echoed to a wailing death song from the breaking heart of some despairing prisoner. Rarely the voice of prayer went up from these cells except rested from some frantic victim. Those were days of infidelity. God had withdrawn his presence from the atheistical nation. From one of those cells came a sweet voice that uttered eloquent and inspiring words in clear, ringing tones, thrilling every listener and kindling a new heroism from the ashes of despair. Those lips did not beguile fellow captives to exhausting, enervating tears, but aroused all the patriotic fire, the exalted courage, and the stoicism of which they were capable. They caught the unshrinking lofty tone of the bold-spirited orator, and when she paced the narrow courts, gathered round her with a love and devotion they might have paid to an angel. Fascinating and graceful, even in prison robes, stately and commanding, yet womanly and gentle, the sturdiest bowed before her, and the weakest leaned upon the strength her impassioned soul could impart. But one day she smilingly glided past them, attired in flowing white drapery, and her dark hair falling in wavy abundance to her girdled waist. She hastened cheerfully along the winding passages, passed through the massive entrances, and soon stood in the hall of the Palace of Justice before an excited and tumultuous throng. In vain her voice richly and eloquently rose above the confused murmurings boldly speaking her own defense. Not in crouching supplication, not in fear of death, not in appeals to the humanity and sympathy of the assembly, but in daring defiance of their imputing a single crime to her or to those illustrious men who had gone before her to the scaffold. She sealed her own doom while proudly asserting her innocence. She was condemned to die. Fully prepared for this sentence, she received it with unchanging countenance, and returned to her cell as cheerfully as she had emerged from it, intimating her fate to the prisoners as she passed them, by silently drawing a finger across her white throat. That night an old harp that had long lain untouched in the solitary cell resounded with slow, mournful tones, accompanied by a full, melodious voice, sadly sweeping a wild requiem through the long galleries that had been silent to every sound but human groans or shouts of exultation or despair. The shuddering captives recognized the farewell. The following morning, the gloomy opening of a November day, a long line of carts, crowded with victims for the guillotine, issued from the yard of the conciergerie. In the last was the white-robed heroine of the dungeons, still calm and self-possessed, still bearing up the drooping spirits of those who stood beside her. An old man with whitened locks, weak and trembling, leaned upon her sustaining arm. Her own face was brilliant and blooming, freshened and tinged with the cool morning air. The near approach of a sudden and horrible death was no intimidation to her heroic spirit. Nearer and nearer the rough vehicle approached the scaffold, as those in advance were emptied. Higher and more ghastly grew the heaps of the slain. Faster and fuller 
rolled the crimson tide. At last came the cart with the old man and the beautiful, fearless woman. She was still brave and undaunted, he shrinking and pale with terror. Go first, said she, that you may not witness my death. But the brutal executioner commanded her to ascend first. You will not refuse a woman's last request, she replied mildly, and with one of her winning smiles. The murder-inured man was one like everyone else upon whom that fascinating smile fell. The old man with the whitened locks bowed his head first beneath the axe. Then came the noble woman with firm, unfaltering step. She knelt. An instant of awful stillness was succeeded by the terrible sound of the sliding axe, and the beautiful head, enveloped in its dark veil of flowing ringlets, fell from the block. The noble, heroic, exalted spirit of Madame Roland had gone to the eternity she had so often and so darkly questioned. Her soul was, in an instant, ushered to the presence of an unacknowledged God, before whose tribunal human philosophy and stoicism and lofty endurance must vanish into nothingness. End of section 41. Recording by Matthew Reese, Davenport, Iowa. End of the Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins.